Anyone tell me what the answer to the bell ringer is? Yeah. 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 Have you ever heard the uh, the old saying, the old phrase? I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. That comes from the Fifth Amendment, right? You don't want to incriminate yourself. So it protects you from that. So. Once you said it, you said it. Yeah, once you said it and it's on the record, um, I mean, if you have a good lawyer, they might be able to, but yeah, like if you go, if you like, say if you get arrested or something and you admit to the crime and then later like, no, actually I did do it, I, I think you probably um, committed to your crime for admitting it. But maybe they could be like, oh no, my, my client here was not, you know, capable of, Basically, it, it, it's like it, it goes along the lines of like the Miranda rights too, where it's like you have the right to remain silent, um, and it can be used against you in court of law. You know, like that, like when you watch like a cop show or something, that's your Miranda rights. And so, it basically just like prevents you from say, like incriminating yourself. If that makes I don't know if I'm explaining it great, but it's it's along those lines. So when you're trying to like get rid of this like cop happy to mind, that would be constitutional. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Great question. Oh, uh, okay. So planners are out. <clears throat> uh, citizenship handbook. We got parts eight and nine today. We're gonna do cup to call notes. We'll do it slightly different today than we've done it. Um, we're gonna do like more of like a PowerPoint again. Uh, start thinking about uh, clubs. You guys did clubs last year. So just start keeping clubs in mind on uh, what you might wanna do. Uh, Miss Alco and I are doing rock painting, so. You should join us. Fun. Paint some rocks, it's gonna be so much fun. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that tomorrow as well. But have that written down in your planner. So, you guys, uh, I, you guys have had me quite a bit for quite a while now, a couple weeks now, and so you're pretty familiar with me, but I feel like some of you guys might not be, so I kind of just want to like reintroduce myself. So I am also just like you guys, I'm a student, I, I'm a student teacher through the University of Montana, hence the Grizz Polo today. <laughs> yeah, so just like you guys, um, I got I got assignments and things that I got to do too. So a part of that is is a, I uh, observe Miss Halcrow at the beginning of the year. So like first period, second period, I kind of observe and then I kind of take over. Um, you guys have been you know aware of that. 
And so I, I do a lot of observing. I take a lot of notes for myself, things that I can work on, things that I can improve on. Um, and, and so a part of that process is, is me doing some lectures that I get uh, critiqued on by Ms. Palcrow and people who uh, oversee me in the teaching program. So that being said, I'll probably do a couple lectures throughout the year um, that on my own. Um, kind of as I grow and keep going, I'll probably start taking more and more, taking the reins over a little more until I graduate in May. So for those of you who don't know, um, yeah, I'm Mr. Rossmiller, and I will be gra I'll be here till May, like the second week of May or something like that, until I graduate and I'll become a full-time teacher. Um, after that, you know, maybe I'll see you guys next year at Great Falls High. Maybe I'll go to North. Maybe I'll go to CMR. Don't go to North. <laughs> um, a little, let's see, a little bit more about myself, just getting a little more personal. Um, let's see, I, I have, has anyone ever been to Power High School? Or Power? Yes. No? Yes? Oh, yeah. Yeah? yeah. 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 Really? Yeah. So that's where I graduated high school from. I graduated with about like 30 kids. Or, sorry, I graduated with eight kids, 30 in my high school. So I, I was just a small town, classy kid. Uh, I went to college in Aberdeen, South Dakota my freshman year before transferring over to the University of Montana. Uh, I wanted to become a history teacher, or mainly just a teacher in general. Uh, I, I've always really loved the concept of history and I, I really enjoy it. Um, but the main reason is is I, I my like role model growing up was, was my teacher and so I just wanted to be kind of like him and, and kind of uh, kind of give back in, in a sense, right? Because I want to be a positive uh, role model like he was, to not just me, but many other people. So that's what made me want to become a teacher. Um, I got two dogs, Jeter and Nova, and I have a fiance, her name is Gabby. She's pretty awesome and great. She actually was a dynamo just like you, years and years ago. She actually had Miss Halcrow as a teacher. And she's beautiful inside and, she's and out. Beautiful inside and outside. And if you want to know more about her, you ought to ask her. But she's going to be a nurse. Uh, so she's pretty cool. Have you guys ever had gut busters before at the fair? Yes. What? Yes. Fried, fried hamburgers. Fried hamburgers at the fair? You guys want to go to this? I don't know. You've never been to the Great Falls Fair? My freshman year. Oh, really? Okay. okay. You have to try it out. It's called Gut Busters. It's a deep fat fried cheeseburger. <laughs> you? No, no, it's crazy. Yeah. Really yeah. 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 So, long story short, her family uh, helped run it, and so you guys will see me there this summer. I've been there for like the last five years. I just sit back, I flip burgers, I make it, I sell them. It, long story short, that's that's what uh, that's where you can maybe get the chance to. Well, she'll probably be visiting during the school this year, but I'll be there. Um, so, citizenship handbook. Uh, we, we've been going over that. We're, I'm going to do parts eight and nine today. We're going over the First Amendment. <coughs> also, go ahead and get your notes out and your book out. Go to page 266. Should most of you guys already have it out. Elizabeth has hers out. Out. Elizabeth, since you're the closest to the board, do you mind just reading for us out loud the definition of the First Amendment? So, you guys are all pretty familiar with the First Amendment. We've gone over it when talking about the Bill of Rights. But we know them in a little bit more simpler terms when we think of it. We don't think of this article here. We think of them more like this. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, petition, assembly, and uh, press, assembly, and petition. You guys will probably already have a pretty good familiar, like, 
idea of what I mean by religion, freedom of religion, right? You have the, you are able to promote your beliefs religiously or not. <coughs> That's guaranteed by the First Amendment. Public uh, freedom of speech. What you can say and not say. Freedom of press. Is, do you guys know what I mean by freedom of press? Connor, is that the right to criticize government? Yeah, absolutely. So that the freedom of press is is basically it grants journalists and us. We can be on Twitter, right? We can criticize um, all we want. Yes, I know what Twitter is. Come on. Um, so journalists can can openly do an article criticizing a government without being recommended reprimanded for it. Assembly, what about assembly? What, what does it mean? Freedom to assemble. So like. So like, remember, you know, like, um, this is my first time using this analogy, but like, Avengers, assemble. You know? You know what I'm talking about? No, yeah. Come together, right? Yeah, so, okay, so this is your freedom to come together as a social group or a group to potentially protest or petition. What petition? Uh, right to protest. Yeah, it's a right to protest, but you do it by petitioning, by like um, signing your names on like a sheet, <coughs> right? Like you can protest um, so many different things through, through petitions. We'll get, we'll, and we'll cover more into this as we go. But for now, all I want you guys to have down, I mean, you can have this down on your notes if you want, but mainly in the green head headliner, like how we've been doing our notes, the First Amendment. So <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and read. Uh, the first running header is freedom of religion. So you guys go ahead and write this down. I'm gonna go ahead and read. The colonial past was very different on the minds of the American leaders when they set out the, the right to build rights in 1790. It is not surprising, therefore, that the colonial experience is inspired by the very First Amendment to the Constitution, which is the First Amendment that we just kind of talked about. So, freedom of religion. As you have learned, pilgrims, Puritans, Puritans, Quakers, Catholics, and Jews had come to North America because they wanted to pra practice their religion freely. Yet, Colonial religious leaders such as Thomas Hooker, Roger Williams, <coughs> and Hutchinson were later driven from Massachusetts after clashing with the community of leaders over religious questions. The founders wanted to avoid such church versus state disputes. Thus, the, the First Amendment affirms the freedom of the ba freedom of religion as a basic right. Americans are free to follow any religion or no religion as they choose. This is the part of the First Amendment inspired by the Virginia Statute on Religious Freedom, written by Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson spoke on spoke of a wall of separation between church and state. However, not everyone agrees on the nature of separation. Some people believe that the First Amendment means religion should play no role in government. Right? No role in government. Others argue that amendments merely say that the Congress cannot establish an official state supported church or make any laws that interfere with the freedom of worship. So let's break this down a little bit. No, you want to read to me what, so read to me that, uh, that first page line there. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, Americans are free to follow any religion or no religion. To just That's the basic overall summary of that paragraph. I kind of want to break this quote down a little bit and kind of think about it. The wall of separation between church and state. What do I mean by state in this context? <laughs> the government. Thank you, Aiden. Good job. Yeah, so the church and the state need to be separated. Not a literal wall, metaphorically, right? We Metaphorically, we mean... When, when the government's making policies and, and, and doing new bills, the church and the state need to be separated. They can't clash. Uh, yeah, exactly like how the book says, the First Amendment means that religion should play no role in government. 
Religion has nothing, needs to be separate from politics. Is that all that's saying? So, make sure you have that written down. If not, uh, we can get you guys caught up. But hopefully you guys had time to get that down. So next, the next header, we're gonna be talking about freedom of speech and freedom of the press. You guys have any questions so far? Are we are we good about freedom of religion? It can be kind of controversial yeah. sometimes, but um, hopefully I can get into greater detail for you guys. So freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Dictators understand that their power depends on silencing dissent or to disagree. Remember how we kind of talked about that yesterday? Dissent was to disagree. They will often shut down newspapers or jail people who criticize the government. Do you guys, uh, were you guys in here? Did you guys watch the CNN student news that we had on here the other day? That was uh, that uh, the American woman reporter that was in China and she was interviewing. Oh yeah. yeah. You guys, you guys were, okay, cool, awesome. So do you remember when they were interviewing that one lady and then they go, those guys in like the black coats came and like kind of took her away and they were like monitoring all their conversations. Yeah, they do that because freedom of speech and, and like um, talking against the government, um, it's, not, it's not legal there, like it is here. So that's why you don't see those kind of behaviors um, here. But there you do, and they were getting followed and tracked and making sure like they were censoring them and making sure everything, uh, that they weren't talking bad about the government. And, and so people in other countries actually go to jail for that. I mean, that's crazy. So, <coughs> let me get back to where I was at here. So, so yeah, uh, the First Amendment protects the American to speak without the fear of punishment. The First Amendment also protects the press from government censorship. Censorship is the power to review change or prevent the publication of news. Freedom of the press also means that journalists cannot be arrested for criticizing the government or public officials. You know how I talked about that at the beginning of the class? So this just ensures that journalists, or even us, we can freely speak our mind um, without getting arrested, like how that CNN student news example that we saw that one, that one day, um, like I just talked about. Um, but you know, there, there is, there's levels to it. I'm gonna say that word a lot today, so you guys don't get annoyed. But there's levels to each thing. So yes, uh, they can openly criticize, but they can't lie and make things up, right? So we live in this world today, we live in a society where social media plays a huge role in our daily lives, right? TikTok, Instagram, you, there's a lot of clickbait or fake news, right? It's very important that where you're getting your sources from have to be live or reliable. So that's why it's important when you guys you get into high school and you start doing more research-based papers that you're using credible sources, like peer-reviewed articles or journals. Typically not things that are dot coms because they're biased. Because sometimes they can promote false things that you can actually get in trouble for. And I'll explain that. So framers knew that a free flow of ideas is vital to democratic government, right? So in order to improve, you need competition and you need uh, criticism. That's how you get better. Still, freedom of the press is not unlimited. So it's not like press has total freedom to do whatever you want, just like I was saying. Press has the responsibility to present the news fairly and accurately. <coughs> Individuals may sue journalists for libel. So journalists can get sued for promoting fake and false information or the publication of false information. So that's that's exactly it. Um, so yeah, we, we have freedom of speech, we have freedom of press, but there's levels to it. There's responsibility to news. You can't just make things up. So yeah, we have the right as American citizens to speak out without fear of punishment. We can say what we want, mostly right, without getting punished and censorship and libel, right? So you don't need to write this down, but this is me just kind of going on more of a, um, a rant, a lecture, this is me just trying to educate a little better versus just kind of teaching directly out of the book. I kind of want to give my own take. 
Uh, so, so things I want you guys to know as future citizens and future voters and as students. So political and religious speech is always gonna, is, is mostly protected, depending, right, levels, there's levels to it. Disruptive speech is not protected. What do I mean by this? I mean, yes, you can openly criticize um, your boss. You can go out to your boss one day and say, hey, I, you know, I don't like the way you do this and this and this and this and this. Okay, yes, I mean, you're not gonna get arrested for voicing your opinion. But can your boss fire you for talking negatively about him? Yeah. Yes, because you're directly attacking him. So yes, absolutely. Disruptive speech is not protected. Along as, as well as vulgar speech is also not protected. Vulgar speech is kind of lot along the same size as, as disruptive. It's just kind of talking more inappropriately. Um, talking inappropriate about someone, uh, is, is that's not protected. Like you can't just go up to someone and say something uh, that, that could be considered misconstrued or uh, inappropriate. I'm gonna skip this one for now because I'm gonna come right back to it. Uh, school uh, newspapers uh, are considered school speech. So do you, guys, do you understand like what a school newspaper? You guys, you guys don't have one here at East, right? You don't have a student-led one? Yeah, so you know how you guys, so when you get to high school, you probably will. At least I had one when I was in high school. I don't know if it's just to make a small school thing or not, but I do believe Great Falls High was all the clubs and electives it had. I'm sure it had one. Um, but my whole point of that is that, yeah, on Monday when you guys had the counselors, I don't think freshmen maybe get the opportunity, but maybe juniors and seniors you get the opportunity to take yearbook or newspaper. That newspaper, even though it's written by students, that becomes the school's speech. So that being said, the principal has the ability to censor things out and delete things if if, um, if they find it like, oh, well, that's too political or that's not, you know, that's too vulgar, too opinionated. They actually have the power to, sen to uh, censor that kind of stuff. But I kind of want to go back to this one. Praising drugs is not protected. So can I, so Obviously, it's because it, it, it's um, it's projecting something onto someone else that is not appropriate. Drugs are not appropriate. So, can I come to school wearing a shirt that say that says uh, drugs are awesome and cool? No, I can't because it's disruptive. But could I come to school saying? like wearing a, a, a armband or something, or something that was in the, the line of protesting the war. Can I, can I do that? I can. If I want to protest the war, I can do that. What exactly? Thank you. So I'll get into more detail about that. So, in short, yes. Can't wear shirts that promote drugs, but you can wear armbands that promote that promote um, a petition or a, or a not a petition, but yeah, speech, speech, exactly. So <clears throat> you don't need to write this down either. Uh, this again, this is me just kind of trying to educate. So there's this uh, famous Supreme Court case uh, in 1969, I believe, uh, 1971 ish. So uh, anyway, it's so focused around Mary Beth uh, Tinker and John Tinker, her brother. They wanted to protest the war, uh, the Vietnam War, and by doing that, they wore these armbands. And actually, if you see this little smudge right here, I'm pretty jealous. You guys might not be as jealous as me, but that's actually her actual autograph. And this is Madison Talcros, and it's pretty cool that. She is a pretty, like a, in the social studies community, she is a prominent figure. And so she actually has her autograph, which is really cool, especially because if you look at this photo, you might think, oh, this photo from 1932. No, it's, it's really not because that's them now. So this is cool, I think, personally, um, to have this. Uh, so anyway, I'll, I'll show you a little video that can explain this whole situation a little better. Uh, but yeah, basically the court said that the First Amendment applied to public schools. 
and that they could not censor student speech unless it disrupted the educational process. Interesting, I agree with it. Oh, was that Noah? Sorry, it, it just yeah, both my hands, go ahead. Supreme Court rule that a, in 1969, the Supreme Court ruled that a public school forbidding students from wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War was a violation of the First Amendment rights. So how does a seemingly subtle act of protest result in such a momentous decision? And on what basis was the case decided? This is the story of Tinker versus Norm. In Des Moines, Iowa, a group of students led by 15-year-old John Tinker, his sister Mary Beth, and their friend Christopher Eckert were quietly carried out their own act of protest by wearing black armbands to school. The school district prohibited the armbands, threatening suspension or expulsion if the students didn't comply. The Tinker family, active in civil rights and anti-war movements, were committed to protecting free speech and took the school district to court. After the district court ruled against the Tinkers, the case was brought to the United States Court of Appeals, which resulted in a tie. The Tinker family would make one final appeal in 1968 to the Supreme Court. With the lower level courts divided, how would our highest court come to a decision, and what would it mean for the Tinker family and other American students? Attorney Dan Johnston took on the case for Tinker, arguing that the school district's armband policy was unconstitutional and violated the students' First Amendment rights. He also maintained that since students have been granted constitutional protection of the right to symbolic expression in schools in the 1943 case of West Virginia State Board of Education versus Barnett, the same reasoning should apply to the students' use of the armband. Opposition to the case was firm, arguing that the students' decision to wear the armbands was a disruption to the school's duty to maintain order. So much so that it outweighed their First Amendment rights. The interpretation of the Constitution had been debated and a major decision was underway. Do First Amendment rights disappear when a student enters a public school? According to the Supreme Court, that answer is no. The seven to two count came with Justice A. Fortas writing for the majority. Fortas wrote that teachers and students, quote, do not shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the schoolhouse door. Fortas further argued that student expression cannot be suppressed when it doesn't interfere with school discipline. The dissent maintained that the Tinker's behavior was a disruption, a sentiment echoed in future cases. In 1986, the Supreme Court ruled that a student could be legally suspended for lewd speech. And in 1988, the court decided that it was within a school's power to censor student newspapers. Turbulent political times often inspire protests, especially among passionate young people. What will next test the limits of free speech and result in a Supreme Court controversy? This was the story of Tinker versus Norm. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more content. Alright, thank you for listening to my rant and my video. We'll get back to the fun reading part again, freedom of assembly and petition. <coughs> so if this stuff will get back on track, if you want to write down again. As you have read, King George III in Parliament is going to call on his petition, right, to call on his petition protesting the Stamp Act. The colonists were against the Stamp Act. You guys read about the Stamp Act during the American Revolution prior to it, that led to it. They wrote, they made a protest, right, that's an example of a protest. Such experiences have powerful effects on the leaders who wrote the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment thus guarantees the right of Americans to assemble in a peaceful protest and also protects their right to petition the government for a change in policy. Peaceful assembly petition. Key word I want you guys to take away here. It guarantees the right to Americans to assemble in a peaceful protest. So what I mean by that, 
guarantees the right of Americans to assemble in a peaceful protest. One can make the argument that there's two types of protest. What would they be? Nonviolent and violent. Exactly. Absolutely. So then once things get turned from a protest to a riot, no longer can become constitutional and you can then get arrested. Right? You can't just like, oh, we're protesting this, so we're going to go down and, and, and burn things and blow. No, that's when the cops can get involved and they can start arresting people once it turns violent. Once it starts being violent or you start intimidating others, then it's no longer peaceful. And that's when you that like the First Amendment no longer applies. But there are peaceful protests, right? Can anyone think of an example of a peaceful protest? Really? Thank you, great, sit-ins. You can just, you guys can uh, lead a sit-in on something. Um, you can do a march, you can do a rally, uh, you can do a boycott, you can boycott. Um, you can look at some, you can boycott school milk, right? But oh, we're not drinking milk anymore. We want soda pop. Oh yes. Right? Maybe don't do that. I don't know. But, um, milk is great. But you can boycott it, right? But no one ever getting milk ever again. You know what I'm saying? So that would just be an example. That's a little extreme. Don't do that. Um, but I like to make things a little relatable in that sense. In that sense. All right. Protects the uh, protects the right to petition the government for a change in policy. Can anyone think of a petition? Probably. Uh, so something that doesn't go through the time and time and time. So like the stand backs, right? They petition day. Yeah. Have you guys ever uh, heard of the Montana petition to Canada? You guys heard about that? It's it's more or less just like a joke at this point, but there's still people signing it. I'll show you. It's it, it's nothing serious. Don't get worried. But there's a petition that's been going around for years. Sell Montana to Canada for one trillion dollars to eliminate the national debt. What? It's not real. It's just like a pretend thing. But it has twenty four thousand signatures. <laughs> we have too much debt, and Montana is useless. So tell them it has beavers or something. <laughs> so it, it's not like a legit website or anything, but it's just an example of, of, of the power a petition can have. So I, I'm sorry if I got you guys distracted or whatever, but so, so don't get worried. Don't go home and say Montana's going to be part of Canada. That's not going to happen. I was just showing you guys an example of a petition. So no need to fear. We're not gonna we're not gonna be a providence. Uh, but I just want to show you guys an example of a petition by making it more relatable to you guys. So we're gonna start part nine now. So let's go ahead and flip the page. So part nine, we talked a lot about federal governments. We talked a lot about federal governments, their powers their duties, their responsibilities, their jurisdictions, um, all that fun stuff, right? There's some similarities though that we'll talk about. What, uh, here's a little topic question. What more, what do you think more directly impacts your life? State and local government or the federal government? Raise your hand. Aiden? Federal? Well, well, I mean, it would be state. But, I mean, but yeah, so, on it, so I mean, so there's no right or wrong answer to that. You guys are both right. But, however, state and local government, in a sense, does kind of have more influence and power on you because they can dictate certain policies and, and laws that directly impact, um, impact you. So just the first example that comes to my mind, is there's no federal law on um, on marijuana per se, right? So in some states, marijuana is, is considered illegal. Some states, it's, it's considered legal. That's a state by state thing. It's not a federal, it's, it is federally 
illegal, but st it's still up to the states in some areas, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, so like if you go to like, I believe like Idaho is not legal, so like if, even if you had had it on you there, that's, you can get arrested for that. But Montana, no, as long as you're above the age of 21, right? So that, so that's. have a certain amount too. Yeah, yeah, in a certain amount. Or medical marijuana. Yeah, if you have a recreation, or not recreation. Medical marijuana, not recreational. And um, I think it's 21. Um, but that's like so there's but there's other examples that I can talk that we can talk about that state policies can directly influence us more than federal policies. Taxes, absolutely. Sales tax, absolutely. A little more more like more um, extreme like death penalty. You guys, I don't know if you, I mean. Basically, it's up to the states. They can decide on the death penalty. Um, I don't think Montana, Montana, it's not legal in Montana, but I think that's Texas or something like that. Um, only a few states have the death penalty. Yeah, Texas. Um, but that's a state by state case. Maybe one day it'll become a federal thing, but I don't know. Um, so, part nine, I, I, yeah, like I said, we've been, we've been going into great detail about federal, now we're gonna get a little more closer to home, hit on the state government. Uh, in general, the federal government deals with the national issues. States concern themselves within their state, that makes sense. The states concern themselves, okay, so, so the state government resemble the federal governments in many ways, so they are similar in the fact that they also have a constitution, they have three branches of government. Um, we have an executive branch, like Montana has an executive branch, uh, and a judicial branch. Uh, but there are some differences between the state and the federal government. Nebraska, for instance, their state is uh, one in the union, the only one in the union with a one uh, house legislator. So remember when we were showing you guys the um, electoral college map and, and Nebraska has a split vote? Uh -huh. That's part of their constitution. And so like, yeah, do we have a president of Montana? Technically, uh, Yes. Let me rephrase that. No, there's no president. Yes, there's a governor. Just kidding. I don't want to confuse. I mean, obviously, I think you guys probably do that. So we have an executive branch, just like the federal government. But the federal government has an executive branch with a with a uh, president. We have an executive branch with a governor. That's the state. Now moving over to our local government. Does Great Falls have a president of Great Falls? No. Do they have a governor of Great Falls? No. Do we have a mayor of Great Falls? No. Yeah, so that's more down the, down the line. So yeah, we have a governor of Great Falls. Does anyone know who this is? This, not the governor of Great Falls, just so you know. Or mayor of Great Falls, ah, we got lost on. Greg Gianforte, yep. He is our governor. Um, so a little more while you guys are getting these notes down, I'll talk a little more about it, but I kind of just kind of did hit on it already though. So state governments, we have the power through our state Congress and our state courts that we can infect, we can like put on laws like state tax or, or the death penalty. We also have like regulations on like um, what age you can get your driver's license at. So like in some states, it might be 18. Ooh. Some states 16, some states, I think 16 is actually the minimum age. So how many of you guys are gonna be able to take your, like take drivers out this summer? Mm -hmm. Quite a bit of you actually, yeah. Nice. Yeah, so that's that's pretty fortunate because in other states, they have to wait till they're 18, but why do you think that is? Like, in New York, it's probably 18. Why is New York 18 and Montana 18? Yeah. Because it's so Right, exactly, and in Montana, right, we're what we're what um, some people would call a blue collar state, right? So that means we got a lot of farming and ranching, and farmers and ranchers and ranchers, they can't do it all on their own. Sometimes they need their family, they need their help. We need someone to drive their grain carts, right? So that's why, you know, you might see some 12, 13, 14 year olds driving, it's because of that reason, right? Montana has established itself on that. 
get a 14 year old who had their Montana driver's license to drive in New York? No. Yeah, they can, right? They still have their driver's license, and they just can't get, if they're 14 in New York, they can't get a driver's license. Or 16, sorry, not 14, I'm sorry, I apologize. But yeah, they, they have to be 18. But like, even me though, like, I would not want to drive in New York. That's why there's just so much walking. <laughs> right? Doesn't that just sound gross? I'd rather just take my horse. <laughs> yeah. Um, so <laughs> yeah, sorry. So we'll do a little more of an interactive lesson here now. I need you guys to help me. So, you guys familiar with what this is called? Why do we have to do the title? Because um, you don't have to write. You don't have to write this down. You have your question. But you do have to help me fill it out. All right. So this is the this is the national government. This is the United States as a whole. This is the state government. So like Montana. Who has the power to administer administer criminal justice? Uh, both power of the national government. It is a power of the national government, but it's also a power of the state. Of both. Oh, oh. Oh. Maintain schools. Uh, Absolutely. Patent laws. Government. Yeah, things like copyright laws. Yeah. This one might trick you. What about established post offices? Oh, okay. That's not the state, state, right? State. Or is both. it both? Yeah, it's both. both. Oh, it's actually national. Yes. yes. I know. Isn't that kind of weird? Banks. They're clearly war. Wait, are we supposed to? Banks. Yeah. Banks are both. What about declare war? Both. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Craig, 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 like uh, one of the, you know, like you know, like when you be on like the radio or the TV, those like alarm, you know, that alarm sound. You know what I'm talking about? Uh, yeah, right. So there's like, like, oh, Montana has just declared war with Brazil. Get ready, you know. Like that's not, that's not gonna happen. So. Oh, all right. What about race tax? Those aren't states. Federal government. States. States isn't wrong. Both. Both. But both. Coin money. National. Otherwise, Montana, we'd be just printing out money. Provide public welfare. States. Actually, both. Sorry. Public welfare. That's just general welfare for all. Public safety. What about public safety? Yeah, that one is is state. Regulate foreign trade. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, we're not gonna be Montana. Like even though we trade our oil and our and our farming products, but we don't like as Montana. We don't regulate the foreign the trade with like other countries. Is what I'm trying to get at. So we have good resources here in our lovely state, but we don't regulate. Marriage. Yeah, laws about marriage, like divorce. State, 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 state. absolutely. All right, national government. Great job, everybody. You guys are Wait, awesome. Are we, are we, done? we are not done with notes. Why? Because we got so much time yet to learn. Like five minutes. Five minutes. All right. All right. So state services. We are almost done, though. Enforcing the law, protecting property rights, regulating businesses, building and maintaining highways, operating schools, or state parks, uh, just to name a few of the tasks the state oversees. In addition, states are supervised uh, public education by setting standards and funding school programs. So there's a lot of state services that help keep the flow going. What do I mean by this? I mean, when it snows and it blizzards and there's drifts in the middle of the road, state services would be a plow coming, driving at 5 a.m. 
plowing the road for our for our parents and stuff to like get to work and just for safe travel and transportation. Right? And it's like the law enforcement, highway patrolmen, sheriffs, making sure private property is protected, regulating businesses, right? Making sure they're not corrupt or trying to like get a monopoly or anything like that. Building and maintaining highways, right? We want to make sure our interstates stay fine, even though construction can be so annoying, especially in the summertime when you want to go somewhere, but the AC's not working and you're trapped in the line. Uh, I'm flashbacks. <laughs> so if you didn't get this down, we'll, we'll, we can get you back up, but. Local governments, right? This is more closer to home. This is what I'm talking about. This is more Great Falls. This is more closer to home, more directly impact. Uh, as you can see, the Constitution car carefully identifies the powers of the state and the federal government. However, it says nothing about the local government in the Constitution. Local governments administer smaller units, such as counties, cities, and towns. Local government have budgets, just like the federal and state, but most of their money is spent on education. Cities and towns and districts and teachers uh, buy the books and supplies and maintain the schools and buildings. The local governments do not have the sole control of the school system. They are required by law to meet the state's educational standards. Why are we doing this, Ms. Outro and Mr. Rosgar? Because we have state standards that we need to follow to make sure you guys are up to par, get your diplomas and graduate, and get, go to college or get a job. Um, so, <laughs> so in smaller terms, right, local, infrastructure that's what, like what I basically just said about building roads so last thing uh, before we pack up I plus I'm gonna go I still have a little bit of time left so I'm gonna go over one more thing after this but can anyone answer this question for me I heard it can we was that you state I got I did kind of talk about that but before you guys pack up and, and uh, line up I just kind of want to go over a few things with you real quick um, so you guys are making this test, right? We're, we're giving you guys the responsibility and the power to make this test, which is cool. Uh, there's 20, uh, there's 10 uh, parts, two per, so there's gonna be 20 questions. We're gonna work on that uh, maybe tomorrow or Monday. Uh, I can't remember, I think it's Monday. Uh, but what are, like, are we gonna have, is one of your test questions gonna be what's five plus five? No. 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 But it can be, how many amendments are there? 27, you know? <laughs> it can be how many members are in the Senate? 100. So you guys will have the freedom to kind of um, manipulate and do that and, and go over, and we'll assign you to groups or whatever to form the questions. Um, one last thing I just wanted to cover was, uh, what about cults? Oh, yeah. You know a cult? You know what I'm talking about? Or like um, like a social group that's potentially negative or dangerous? Yeah. So like the KKK, for example, is the first one that usually comes to mind. Are, 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 they, are they legal or illegal? Illegal. Why are they illegal? Because they have their own they're, they're completely legal. You can have your religious beliefs, you can have your hate beliefs, but if they act on it, if they are promoting violence and actually acting on their violence, like lynching someone or tar and feathering someone that you guys will learn about, or like just in general, like that's when it becomes illegal. So yeah, social groups like the KKK are totally legal until they infringe on other people by using intimidation and violence. So yeah. Wait, gangs are illegal though, right? Gang? You have the right to assemble, right? But once you start acting on things and start using violence, committing crimes, once you start committing crimes, you're no longer protected. Great job today, everybody. Thank you for your participation. You can't leave early, no. I'm gonna cry myself. So if all I had to take was to let you leave early, then I would have been the favorite team for so long. See you guys. You can leave. You can leave early now. Oh, really?